welcome to Staging a Woman's Lives. And uh, we want to thank Actors Equity for and the EEO Equal Employment Opportunity Committee for hosting this event tonight. Um, I joined the EEO committee about 18 months ago <coughs> because I was really concerned about the uneven playing field in our industry. And I wanted to do something about it. So what to do? Um, you know, as we all know, or maybe some of us don't, but women make up at least 50% of the equity membership but are still seriously underrepresented on American stages. Women also buy 70% of theater tickets and they make up 60 to 70% of theater audiences. So those are very interesting statistics that we need to all be conscious of and following along and, and seeing what we can do. Even an hour thing. We've got a lovely uh, panelists here, four accomplished and inspiring <coughs> panelists. Um, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, on the end here, we have uh, Michelle LaRue, who tours nationally with her repertoire of 30 tales, well told, all using literature focusing on the feminine experience, written in America's Gilded Age, and she has played over 400 venues to date. <laughs> Next we have Elaine Bromka, whose solo show T for Three enjoyed a successful off-Broadway run and now tours nationwide. Um, Garrett and I were fortunate enough to see Elaine's show on Saturday night at the Fort Hamilton Army Base, and it was fabulous. So keep an eye out for it and check it out when it comes around. Um, then we have Benjamin Ensley Klein, who was the director of Anne, the Ann Richards story. Uh, written and performed by the wonderful Holland Taylor. And uh, Benjamin is recently the Associate uh, Director for Curious Incident of Dogs and Night. So that's our uh, national tour right now. So that's <laughs> <laughs> we also have the fabulous Perry Daphne. And Perry has a very interesting uh, story, I think, about her solo show because she adapted it from her novel, The Resurrection of Alice. Um, she also co-authored two books with Mitch Weiss, Managing Artists in Pop Music and The Business of Broadway. So those are great books that are available, of course, online. Are they available in stores, too? Uh, managing Artists and also uh, The Business of Broadway is. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'll look at those. Um, and <laughs> uh, Garrett Quayley. And Doug's, Garrett is at work on a TV docuseries called Floaters playing the woman card in the White House. Uh, so we all would be interested to be watching that, I think, in the future. And her forthcoming book, Botanical Shakespeare, with a foreword by Helen Mirren, is being released on April 4th. And it's available right now on Amazon for free order. So get in there, place your orders. Yeah. So after the discussion, <laughs> for Q&A, and so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Garrett. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Um, I, I was so thrilled when Katrina asked me to moderate this panel because, um, first of all, yes, as she mentioned, we have been working on this television docuseries called Flotus, uh, playing the woman card in the White House, and there was a particular president who gave us the idea for the subtitle. Um, and uh, but we keep running up against this in television where they say, well, it's too female skewed. I'm like, well, yes, they're first ladies, but it's also political. It's also, you know, we almost had one in the White House. If, we, if we'd had uh, Hillary Clinton become president, does that mean we wouldn't cover the presidency for four years because it's too female skewed? <laughs> so, um, so I've always told people, and I think it's funny that Katrina asked me to have a one-woman show or have a one-person show in your pocket because it allows you to work when there isn't any work. And as from actors, I always hear, you know, there's not enough work for X. And it depends on what that X is. Women often is what we hear. So I was very excited. I had heard about your show before this panel came up because we were interested in, in, in taking a look for the flutist situation. I also have a... Um, a site called History Chick because I feel like women's history isn't told enough. And so it's perfect that this is going on during Women's History Month. And um, and then there's the whole he for she um, <laughs> initiative, which I think Emma Watson started uh, talking about women or men supporting women in historical ventures, in work, in equal pay, and all that kind of stuff. So we'll get into that a little bit. 
And Katrina also gave me some statistics about um, uh, the diversity statistics for one person shows, one woman shows, and it was very hard to find more people for this panel. So there's a lot of open space here, believe it or not, for um, many, many more people to jump on board, take control of your career, and, and have outlets for your creativity. So we'll explore a little bit of how to do that. Please excuse me, I'm not quite used to it. <laughs> My arm must go with me. Um, I do have this in a little bit of a structure, but as, as these things tend to go, they don't always stay <coughs> in, in perfect order. So I wanted to start off with your, some of your personal stories of what brought you to be doing a one-person show. So we'll go all the way over there and circle back. Uh, I have to bring a man into this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, long ago... <laughs> My late husband, Warren Cleaver, who was a director, among other things, thought that it would be a good idea if I had a one-woman show. And we both started looking and thought it would be fun to work together, and we did, and that was the first of a few. Oh, okay. Mm. Okay. And, and Elaine, how, what brought you to do three first ladies? Is that the, is, is this your sole solo show? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to back up before that just for a minute because I never thought of the subject. I never, never thought about it. And uh, I got an audition to uh, audition for a play called The Presidents with Rich Little. I was supposed to impersonate eight first ladies. And I want to pause here for a minute because I wasn't going to take the audition because I didn't know what they sounded like and I thought I was going to fail. And how many of us have felt that way, you know? I can't, I can't. And it got to be 48 hours before, and I thought, well, someone's going to get it. So I went to the Museum of Television and Radio and crammed. And I got it. And once I was doing that, I started doing all this research, and he was great. But there wasn't a whole lot of room for those around him, even though it was a cast of, you know, I was the only woman in it. And my daughter, who was 12 at the time, said, I would rather have you home washing dishes than standing there going, what a wonderful speech, stop. So she said, write your own play. And that's <laughs> And, and coming from a daughter, too, saying, yeah. this is what I want to see women do and what I'm doing. Um, and Benjamin, I'm just going to skip over you because I'm going to do the ladies first. Yes. Perry? Yes. Um, uh, the Resurrection of Alice is not my first or only one woman show. I did my first one on Josephine Baker. It's called Josephine. Oh. And I did that one because I am not uh, particularly musically inclined or a dancer. I move well and I can carry no <laughs> short distances. But, <laughs> but Josephine Baker was so much more than her career. I mean, she, she was a spy in World War II. She wrote five <coughs> books. She was wow. the first black ingenue in a movie. She did not play maids or mammies ever, and her very first film was a silent film, so that's how long ago it was. She had a line of hair makeup and, and um, makeup and hair pomades called Baker Fix. She she was just legendary. She flew planes where most people couldn't drive cars. So I wanted to do highlight the the lesser known aspects of her life. That's why I did Josephine. Mm -hmm. I was writing uh, the Resurrection of Alice because a friend of mine told me about her mother who was put into an arranged marriage. Uh, in the 1940s to a man who was old enough to be her grandfather. Wow. And it, I thought it was disgusting. And I thought, wow, you know, your mother was sold, basically. And I said this to my aunt, who was 87 at the time, and she said, oh, they did that all the time. And not just in the South, in the North, too. <laughs> I said, but that's like selling your kid. And she said, no, it's more like the lottery. <laughs> and see, and now the reason they did that because they were poor and they didn't see any other way out. And, and, and so they see this man over here, he doing all right, he ain't married, I just had a baby. And when this baby becomes of age, and then you can marry my daughter, but we need help now. And that's the difference between what African Americans did and what uh, has been going on for millennia throughout the world, the arranged marriages. You got the bride price years <laughs> before there was a marriage. And she yeah. said, uh, so, it, th th that man might meet another woman before that girl get grown. And if he marries that lady, then the family ain't got to pay him back, but they got helped over that hard patch. And now sometimes that man might die if he that old, mm. and they ain't got to pay nobody back. <laughs> now sometimes he might lose his fortune, 
And even though he been paying all along, and he, if he ain't got no money when it's time for the wedding, the wedding is off. Wow. And, sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes that girl will grow up and love him like he loved her, and they would have married anyway. So it's more like the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, no. <laughs> Some of those words. But uh, that's why I wrote the book. But as I was writing the book, it was supposed to be a biography on my friend's mother. And she died before I ever got a chance to meet her. Mm. And I was so hurt. But having talked to my aunt and knowing that there were many, many women like that, this didn't have to be a biography. It can be a novel that pays tribute to all those women. And so that's why when I began, and uh, I used to read it at a place called Tuesdays at 9. I don't know if they're still around, but they met every Tuesday at 9. <laughs> and it was mostly scripts. It was play scripts and film scripts. And, um, but I realized, I, I was invited there because I was reading in someone else's play. But uh, I realized they read anything. Somebody got up and read some articles he wrote for the New York Times. Somebody else read from a cookbook. It was really engaging, but they read from a cookbook. <laughs> so then I said, well, I'm writing a novel. Can I read here? And they said, yeah. And the first time I read, when I was through, they said, that's a book, but you know that's a play. Uh -huh. And I said, a play? How? Because it was so many people. And they said exactly what you did. One person on a stage, minimal set, and you are everyone. Mm -hmm. And you create everything. And so they were the first ones that put that into my head. And uh, that's how they got to be the show. Thank you. I am interested in why Holland, if you can speak for her, Holland Taylor, who played Anne, chose to write Anne, and then how she brought you in. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I can speak for Holland, uh, but not nearly as well as Perry uh, spoke for herself there. Um, uh, and you're not going to see an Ann Richards impression here tonight <laughs> for me. So, um, so um, Holland was moved to create Anne mainly because she felt a great loss when we lost Ann Richards. She felt that uh, although she was in her 70s, she was taken from us way too early. Um, and she was moved, uh, she tells this amazing story of driving to work. She was uh, very fortunate to be on a television show at that time in LA and driving to work and feeling just this huge loss and not knowing why she felt that connection uh, to Anne. She had met her just once in her life a very brief meeting um, at a restaurant here in New York when Anne was working here in New York. And, um, but she, she didn't really know her. She it wasn't a close friend or anything like that, but she felt this real sense of loss and she wanted to do something about it. Um, and she had this period of grieving and then uh, on the way to work one day, it hit her that it was a play and she pulled her car over to the side of the road in LA, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> crazy. Um, and um, she, exactly, <laughs> she, sat, she sat there and kind of everything that she wanted to create flooded into her head at that moment. Um, and she will tell you, uh, she was very fortunate to have the means at that time to be able to go and do the research that she needed to do. So she then took herself on a seven year journey um, to get us to New York, but she spent a good while, I think it was about uh, two years or so, reaching out to anyone and everyone that knew Anne and going to the archives in Austin and combing through everything. I think she still has a room in her house in, in LA that is dedicated to Anne, mainly in just stacks of paper um, and file boxes and all kinds of things. Um, it is the Anne room. And so she um, went into just this deep place of researching the play. Um, and then finally said to her, okay, you have to write this. Um, you actually have to start writing. She set it herself a deadline and she sat down and wrote it and uh, sent it off to several different people that she trusted to say, is this any good? Um, and all of those people said, yes, and you need to do this. Um, 
and uh, I'll, I'll fast forward a little bit into she actually did one version of the play in Galveston, Texas before I became involved. Um, and at that time, it was all her ideas. She was buying props on eBay. She was doing kind of everything. She, it was a labor of love for her. It was her baby. And she did that production in Galveston, and then at that point knew that she needed someone out there to be her eyes and her ears and to, um, that she could trust. And that was where I kind of came into place. And uh, it was a long journey for me to get her trust because she had worked on it for so long and she needed to know that <laughs> she could trust me um, and that I was there just to support everything that she wanted the show to be and um, that was a long journey because it was her baby and I had to make sure she knew I was only there to put on stage an inspiring tale and everything that she had created. Um, I spent a good while editing the play down because when it was first performed, it was three hours long, um, <laughs> which, um, and she would, if she were here, she would tell you everyone there thought it should be longer because <laughs> they had such a good time and that's the thing. They probably did because it was Holland at her best. Um, and, uh, so, you know, I then became kind of a, a, an editor on the play. And, and I say play because of what you were talking about. You know, the, the show um, wasn't necessarily mem memoir style. She created a big play with many different sets and all kinds of things. So um, that was really lucky for me because then I got to go to work dramaturgically and, say, and said, let's structure this and make sure that this play has a climax, that we know where we're going and everything. And so we did a lot of work together um, creating what eventually ended up here on Broadway. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think that's kind of the general s scheme of how I got involved with it. So going back to now, how you got the idea. Was your uh, director your husband? Uh -huh. Okay, and did, you had a male director too, Byam Stevens, is that right? Yes, I had two directors. Oh. Uh, first, uh, Letty Bart, and then Byam Stevens, who was an amazing dramaturg. If you ever need a dramaturg, then who's also a director. Amazing. Okay. He ran the, the miniature theater of Chester. It's not called right? the Chester Theater. Chester Theater, theater. yes. Um, and did your director own, or did you get a director as well? I had a female director. Uh, the first two times, Shona Tucker, who helped me um, begin converting the book, adapting the book to the stage, and um, and she helped me to a point, and because because we were in Oregon together, and then um, uh, Sherry Levy Linton, she was my first director, but I've had many directors, and I give them all credit because what I do is a compilation, and Talvin Wilkes is probably the one that that gave it the most, and that's a gentleman. And he's also a dramaturg, and that was so important because so my important. first version was like two and a half hours. <laughs> I was so tired, I know I was beating the audience up. <laughs> and I was trying to think, what can I cut? Yeah. And But I knew the story, Sherry knew the story, Shona knew the story, and when we looked, oh, you gotta have this, you gotta have that. Talvin never knew the story, never read the book. I handed him the play, and he's looking, he said, how'd you get from here to there? And I said, because of la, la, la. He said, you got to put that in there. I said, it's not in there. And he said, no. And I didn't yeah, even realize yeah. it because I knew the story and everybody else didn't realize it. And he covered like, I don't know, seven or eight holes, big holes. Yeah. And I said, well, this is all good. We're filling in the spaces, but I'm trying to make it shorter. He said, we're getting rid of these eight pages and these 10. Yeah. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, it's cute. It's nice. We don't need it. Yeah. It's not promoting the story. Yeah. And, and I needed that. I needed someone that did not know. And so um, yeah. he really shaped it. And then the last one was Jackie Alexander, who is also a playwright and a fabulous drum, dramaturg. And he had a problem. I just changed it, like, last year. <laughs> and he, he said, you know, something always kind of bothered me a little bit was this ending, and he explained why. He said, can you change that? And I did it, and it felt better to me. Yeah. And people that have seen it a million times, they said, that was better. Did you do something different, or are you just yeah, yeah. falling into it? And I said, no, it was we were so anyway, it's a compilation of people. Yeah, I, I was just going to add to that because um, um, 
Holland's fond of calling me the cutter, um, and um, I don't take it personally because I know she says it with love. Um, but um, she, we did have this um, back and forth, which I came into it. I was young when uh, Anne was the governor. I come from a long line of liberals, so I of course knew who she was. Um, but I didn't have this relationship with Anne that Holland had. Forged. She knew everyone that knew her at this point. She had gotten permission from her children. She was so close to the material that I would go, you know, the exact same thing. You know, you, I don't think we actually need this here. That's the most important thing in the play. You know, you know, okay, that, well, you've said that 10 times in this session today, so it can't quite be. Um, yes, exactly. So, um, and that back and forth eventually became a dance between us. And there was a day, even in previews and on Broadway, I was walking to rehearsal knowing I was going to cut five paragraphs that were in the play since the first day. And I knew it was going to be very hard for her because not only um, was I taking something that she felt was just like the fabric, like you had to have this here, uh, but also she was the only person up there. So she had the added pressure of being up there on her own, doing something she'd done so many different times and now having to make a cut like that. Um, and we did that even prior in Chicago when we were with the play. We, she took out 10 minutes on her own of the play in Chicago during our previews there. And it was, it's astounding what she would be able to kind of cobble together and get through it. And she'd get to the end of it and she'd be like this because it was all up here, intellectual work that she was doing. You have a number of different shows that yes. you do, correct? Yes, and I should correct myself. My husband directed two of the performances. Cliff Goodwin, also dead, uh, directed a third. And Elaine brushed up a couple of them. Oh, so I, I could get a girl into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so there's two questions I have. Yes. The first one is, when you're doing a one-woman show, do you feel any kind of pressure or commitment or desire to keep it a one -wom a wo an all-woman show, an all-woman You mean everyone production? on the team or something? Yeah. No. Okay. My team is yeah. really, really small. <laughs> <laughs> and then as far as a one woman band goes, is there, I'm sure there are people out there who do this, but would you ever consider, you know, writing it, directing it, producing it, everything yourself? Well, all of my performances started. were written in the Gilded Age. Um, and Literally written in the Gilded yes, Age? Yes, yes. Um, several of them are, are off book and fully staged, but most of them are, does anyone remember oral interpretation styles? Sure, yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what they are. And I, I think I pushed the envelope, but they're basically oral interpretation. What so, is oral interpretation? It's you and a script and a music stand, but you're fully investing all of the characters, you know, different voices, different physicalization. <laughs> and the history of it all is all very important to me. And I've been a writer and editor, so I do a lot of bridge material and introduction and tweak things so it moves along. Um, but I make sure that people understand what's going on in terms of the writing, tweaking, as well as the performance. And I do, I do the research finding the shows. I do the research finding the potential bookers. I write the letters to find the potential bookers. Um, I do everything from finding them to being company manager and wardrobe mistress. So yours is more kind of a one woman band. Mm -hmm. okay. mm. Well, there's and the creation phase and then there's the execution phase. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I don't yes. like the idea of directing myself. I think it's a huge mistake. I think you need an outside eye on it. Um, I want to talk actually about the long one of the lines of this collaboration. There could be those who have a wonderful story, a wonderful idea, a wonderful, or maybe not even exactly what the idea is. They don't know, but uh, I was lucky enough to be put together with Eric H. Weinberger, the playwright. And when you find the right playwright out there that you can collaborate with without egos in the way, it's phenomenal. We pushed one another ahead so much faster than I would have done on my own. And I couldn't, even though I wrote seriously as a young woman, 
I couldn't envision seeing a blank page and coming up with exactly what I know. I didn't even know which ones of what I knew. Eight uh, first ladies were too many. Well, he came in with those three. He came in with the concept of each one at the end of the time there, throwing a tea or having a tea. And once we did that, in fact, he wrote the first scene, Lady Bird, and showed it to me, and I hated it. <laughs> it was all about Lyndon. And I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's not my thrust. And he went back and overnight changed it. About And then I was able to say, get it out, get it out, get it out. We don't need this type. I need more here. But it was the back and forthness that created it. It, it, was, it was amazing. Because, But if you're going to do that, find someone simpatico. Because he's an unusually <coughs> empathetic person who's also funny. You know, so it's light and funny and then <coughs> it gets you. And I didn't want so I didn't want someone to have wordplay that was so clever it wasn't about the people. That's what you have to, you have to find your own water level the, the person you work with if you do that route. Uh, and I do have many different uh, versions of uh, Alice because to do it in schools like public schools, you have to do an hour or less because the period is 50 minutes. <laughs> and they will give you two periods, a little time to set up, do your play, and then do questions and answers. And so um, I have a 60-minute version and that three, two and a half hour version, the, the regular one, is kind of like 90 minutes now. Yeah. And I actually do have a 110 one that I don't think I'll ever do again. Yeah. It's just not necessary. Yeah. But, uh, and, and yeah, you have to remember the cuts. And I know why I cut what I cut for the children, because for Resurrection of Alice, I'm playing different characters. Like Josephine, I'm just playing Josephine. Young, old, other people I'm talking to are either in the phone or in another room or they're out in the audience or it's a press conference or whatever. So, but I'm always Josephine. At Resurrection of Alice, I'm everyone. I have a fight on stage. I win, I lose. I have a near rape, I stop it. <laughs> I, I have a wedding. I'm nauseous, <laughs> I'm happy, you know, depending on what character. And, um, and what I took out for the children was the rape, or the near rape, and any kind of violence things, and some other little things. So it's, um, if I ever go up, it's just easy to recoup, because I know what comes next, and I know why I took out what I took. I've, well, I've never had a script on stage, but I do have it backstage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's just, it's comforting. Yeah. <laughs> it's comforting to know. Okay. Well, that actually brings, moves us into our next sort of, how do you assemble it? What are the nuts and bolts of putting these things together? And you've talked about how you got the directors, although we haven't quite touched on exactly how you came to be the director there. But I wanted to talk about, you know, how you find that director, how you find the collaborator, how much tech do you put into it, knowing that you're going to be going around to a lot of different venues? You know, how do you make those decisions? In part, yes, the, the material is going to drive some of the, those decisions. Like, yeah, I can see why you would want Josephine Baker up there. But um, let's, let's, like, how did you decide that you were going to put all this multimedia stuff in there? And then how dependent on are you on the venue for that? can accommodate that? Uh, the very first time I did Josephine was in the 80s. I think it was 1984. It was in Florida. Um, it, we didn't have Google. We didn't have YouTube. You didn't have access to all those things that you have now. And so I had like still pictures. And I did it at a, a school. I forget the name of it. But it was in Sarasota. And the director was a female. I forget her name. But she was lovely. And she, she helped me compile the pictures. And I always wanted pictures of her because I wanted them <coughs> to, because I could not afford the costumes. And I, and back then, I, I didn't mind doing a banana skirt if I had one. Mm -hmm. Today, nobody would want to see <laughs> but, uh, but back then, I would have, but I just didn't have the money for it. So, th so it was always in my head. And with the director, we said, oh, at this point, at this point, at this point. So we're showing when she was a young girl, and then when she started getting glamorous. And then I put on a fancy hat with the thing, and the people we have just flashes. Now, because of um, YouTube and all of that, it's, uh, it's uh, 
a montage mix of still and moving images. And I do a voiceover before I even come out on stage. So that's in your face and you see that because I want them to know who she is and then when I come out, you know, you can acclimate your disappointment to <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. I know. And, uh, and I have um, I have a couple of friends who are filmmakers and and I usually solicit their aid to put together the video and and still pictures. And that is just wonderful. And one can travel with me. And so um, one what can travel with you? Uh, one of the people that create oh. the images, he actually travels with me. So he's my technical director. And he can talk with the whatever the venue is about the lights and the sound, but he runs the video and sometimes He'll run the lights also, depending on the system. I'm technically challenged, but he knows those things, so that's that's good. Okay. And so one person, one woman shows can travel with crews, or sometimes need to. With well, just two people. Right. Okay. <laughs> two people. And and you now you had some technical difficulty the other night. Oh, please. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean you really have to roll with it when people mess up. But I just have to. But uh, normally. I, I travel by myself if I get on a plane, so I have to teach the crew in four hours, six hours before the show, and it is micromanaged. I mean, you, this, you spell things out, and then you spell them out better, and then you spell them out better. This is all in advance, so that when you arrive, it's all there. And when I first started, I knew absolutely nothing. And the first time I went out, I did it the, mm, uh, uh, what's the name of that? Which? Oh, in New Jersey. It's not coming to me now. What's the name of that? No, uh, further up. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, a lovely place where they brought me out, and I, we were having the tech four hours before the show. This was four hours instead of six that I do now. And uh, they said, I said, now here's the script, and I'll tell you where the sound cues come. And they said, well, where's your tech script? I didn't know what a tech script was. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know anything about this. So, you know, over a period of time, I started to learn the pieces more. But you really have to think in terms of that crew that's just seeing it now. And you have to solve every problem so that you can spell it out and explain it very quickly. You just have to. And How long did it take you to put a text book together? Oh my gosh. I mean, I, not only that, but the press release, the pictures, the website, the, oh. all that stuff. It took years. Yeah. But it's so worth it. And it's, to me, it's thrilling. If I get a prop I love, it's like you're building blocks. You have another building block. And they give you so much security. It's just, it's fabulous. I used to ship uh, two uh, trunks of props. And that was expensive, you know, and they would pick it up because these were theaters and it was, you know, 13 years ago and people had more money. <laughs> now they don't want to do that. So now I drag 62 uh, pounds of props and have mm. them come up with the rest of the props. And that, that works too. So you learn to pare it down more and more and more. So do you have time on the set with the new? Oh, yeah. How much time do you get? Six hours before. We have a uh, four-hour rehearsal. And we just go through the sound cues repeatedly and the prop changes repeatedly for them. And the lights if they come. Yeah. And she's <laughs> meticulous about <coughs> propping and shipping and, and note-taking and list-making. Because it protects I, you. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's yeah. only so much you can control, but control all of that that you can. Yep. Well, that's a very good, <laughs> there's a mantra for you, control all that you can, and that's kind of why one would do a one woman mm -hmm. show. When, uh, yours is pretty low tech, would you well, say? Well, it's, it's become my, my very first performance, the yellow, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, low tech. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> the first performance, the yellow wallpaper, we went out with a set that could easily be reconfigured to whatever space we found, but it really was a set. Mm -hmm and several pieces that had to be put together and I had to iron all these little window seat curtains every time. Um, for our second show, we thought we didn't need all that tech. Um, so Someone Must Wash the Dishes, which was written in 1912 as, as a, lect a satiric lecture, um, I just go out with my own little lectern and a chair and some hand props and that's it. The other performances, yeah, very low tech. Uh, but but I hand always props like what? I mean, because if you've got a lectern and a script, how do you handle? <laughs> um, a reticule. She comes on okay. with a reticule. She comes on with notes that I don't really use. Um, 
Yes, it's in a, in a rose and a little face because the, the uh, anti-suffragist rose was the red one and the suffragist was yellow. Um, and then with the, uh, with the oral interpretation, no, there's no props. There's a lot, I, I mine strategically. So my main concern, I do a lot of found spaces like you know, non-performance spaces like library meeting rooms and banquet halls and rooms in historical societies. Um, so you hope they have decent lighting and you don't expect any lighting changes. Right. And my most, most trouble I usually has, have is if I do need a mic, it's really stressing. I can't be doing 1912 like this. And I don't want one of those big wooden lecterns with the mic on it that hides three-fourths of what they paid to see. Mm. Uh, but yeah, low-tech. And with yellow wallpaper, even I, this is my last year touring that, and I've really honed that down to three prop pieces, I think. And quite a few props. Set props, and it's been quite a few. Yeah, I realize what I was talking about a technical director traveling with me. It was always for Josephine. I've done Alice in many places and I, and I always traveled alone. I have two letters, a book, and my set is a bench. And so uh, usually I tell the venue ahead of time, I need a bench. And if they don't have a bench, I'll go there, I'll buy one. I have, I have done it in Oregon, and I went to a used store, and I said, I just need it for three weeks. And they said, okay, well, you just bring it back. So I bought it, but then they gave me the money back, which is really, really nice. And then sometimes the, the actual place will have it. I, can, I would love lights, lights enhance it, but I don't have to have lights. And I've done it without lights many times, but I have to have my sound cues. And like you said, you, you just have a tech rehearsal with whomever. And usually if it's schools, they have a theater department or they have, you know, that that geek that says, I'll do it. <laughs> and you just run it, run it, run it, run it. Like you said, just cue to cue so they'll know when you get to this in the script. And one, one thing that was just hilarious, I did it in Cleveland in a church and a friend of mine um, produced it. He put it all together. I said on Friday, I want to do it on Monday. This is the first time. And he's never done a play. He does like big events like biting events and, and concerts and things like that. And he got me the stage, the lights, uh, I had video crew, everybody. But he didn't know that a play meant, here's the script and you gotta follow. And so he gave me all these people and then I said, okay, so this is how we do it. He said, no, no, no. I said, no, they need a script so they can follow. And he said to me, pull me to the side, he said, they can't read. <laughs> and I said, yes, they can. He said, not like that. I said, then we have to run it and they'll have to remember, and they were flawless. Oh, we wow. ran it one time, wow. Wow. It, on one day, and then we ran it the next day just cue to cue. Mm -hmm. They were flawless. So I still wonder if when he says they can't read, <laughs> they can't read, but they were, they really were flawless. And he had a big screen and the, a video following me because we were in a flat, uh, we were in a church so everything was flat, and so those people that might have had challenged uh, sight lines they could see me on the big screen. He did that because that's what he does anyway. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, the, uh, Alice can go anywhere. One one costume. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of improv behind the scenes on, on this <laughs> one a one-woman show. I was also, when you were saying that, I was picturing you buying a bench everywhere and, and at the end of your career saying, Perry Gaffney's Museum of Benches. <laughs> <laughs> Someone mentioned to me I should have a bench made that collapses, and I, I am going to do that uh, one day. Yeah. <laughs> well, moving into, because this is Women's History Month, um, we wanted to talk about when you're putting the scripts together, how true do you stay to the history and how fluid for dramatic license? And I think all of you uh, can speak to that. We were talking about, Katrina and I were talking about Alexander Hamilton. And um, the amazing thing that Lynn manuel Miranda did was he, he did stick so closely to Ron Chernow's book. And Ron Chernow has talked about passages in Hamilton that are, um, that are almost verbatim. But you know, the, the, the dramatic license, I guess, is we don't think they burst into song suddenly, <laughs> certainly rap. But uh, so there are people who are very much a stickler for history and others who understand that the, the dramatizing sometimes will 
will need a bit of fluidity. So I wanted to talk. If yours are Gilded Age, um, mm -hmm. where do you where do you find that space? Well, I came to them because I really love the history, and and part of the fun of it is doing the research. <coughs> And I love being able to make it clear either with inflection or gesture, a piece of costume or something else. And if I can't make it work that way, then I do a little tweaking of the script. Um, but the thing is, all of these, even though they're over 100 years old, they're all people like us. They're all circumstances like ours, all the changes of the technology. And I particularly like the New England writers because Tiny little things happen in lives that a contemporary of theirs in the city wouldn't notice and we wouldn't notice. Mm. They totally change lives and they do it in that New England low key kind of way. So I, I pride myself on being as close to the history as I can but proving that it's just as relevant and just as active now. Yeah. Now you, you have to take dramatic license because not necessarily Pat Nixon didn't call like she didn't call the, <laughs> right. the other night. Right. Um, but it, it, it's all based on the research we did because she was very close. She traveled so much, she was very close to her crew, the guys who traveled with her. So we just, yep, yeah, we created the guy. Um, but the relationship was right. Well, I did a lot of research. We both did. Um, uh, and as I was reading people's autobiographies or people's, the biography, the, to one of Pat Nixon that her uh, daughter wrote. As I was reading, I'd think, what, what gets me? What gets me? That's all I went with. I don't care about the history. I don't care. It's not that I did anything other than that, but if you give me a list of blah, 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 blah I don't care. Whereas if I, I was thinking, those, why, those women were wives of guys who said, I want to run for president, or sometimes, I, be, I am president. They just made me president. What happens to them? And this is what Melania is going through. Yeah. yeah. Where she's going, wait, you want me to do what? That's what's interesting to me. Yeah. What did they give up? What were they afraid of? What did they embrace? Well, you know, that's fascinating to me. Other th and we weave in the facts of history, but that's not the thrust at all. Okay. And I, I don't think you can just say, well, I have to do history. I, it, it's got to be alive. You know? okay. Now, yes, and you talked about how much research Holland did. Holland Taylor, by the way, for those who didn't don't know, our, it was on Two and a Half Men. Yeah. For on lots of things. Yeah. Many, many, yes, many, many years. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, uh, one of my favorite things when she won the <laughs> Emmy it wasn't for Two and a Half Men. It was goes, for the practice. Oh, night. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It's a, it's a really interesting question because Holland was she did tons of research. She talked to anyone and everyone. She flew all over the country so that she could interview uh, Anne's security detail, Anne's chief, chief of staff, Anne's secretaries. Um, and one of the things that I really wanted to make sure I made a point of um, is that Holland wanted to tell the story of Anne and also all of the women around Anne. Uh, that was always very important to her, and I noticed that uh, just on the first reading of the of the script, she had people's names throughout that she knew were important, and she even said that Anne said at some point, "You can't tell the story of about me without telling uh, the story about all of the women that have supported me." And um, so that was really important, and also hard for us because as an audience. Uh, following a story and then just hearing a random name that you're not quite sure, do I need to hang on to that name for later? So I had to be judicious to say, oh, we can't include this name, but you better bet we're saying Barbara Jordan as many times as we can so that people can go home if they don't know who Barbara Jordan is and find out who Barbara Jordan is. That is important. Um, and 
while we may not be able to keep this person's name in there, the essence of that person or will remain within the script. And that was one of the things that was really hard for Holland was all of these people that had helped her create the play, she wanted little shout outs <laughs> kind of throughout to the script. Um, and I had to say, you gotta let go of that for the sake of storytelling for the, for the audience. Um, and then the other thing I thought she did brilliantly throughout is in the kind of center section of the play when she is in the governor's office is she strings through all of these um, uh, conversations with Anne's kids uh, who are adults at that point um, but she's taking phone calls with all of the different kids and so you get this wonderful ability to see Anne being the governor having major conversations about whether or not someone should be put to death um, and whether or not she's going to have a stay of execution and the next time she picks up the phone she's talking about who's making the pies for Thanksgiving um, and so she balanced really beautifully in there the 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 woman and mother the governor and uh, woman and uh, you know all of those things back and forth that so was so relatable to our audience um, but it, and the last thing I would say about uh, Holland was very particular that she wanted the play to be not all of everything that Anne had ever said because it wasn't all around we didn't have tons of videotape and everything, um, but she wanted it to be something that Anne would have said. Um, and at some point within our journey, I started forcing her, for those of you that saw the play here in New York, late in the show, she gives a speech um, a that is kind of modern day. Um, and that didn't actually exist in the script until New York. Um, and I said to her before we were coming to New York, I said, um, I think this audience is here to hear from Anne, and they need to know what, we, what Anne would be saying to us now. You have a platform, you have the ability to say what Anne would say, and Holland said, well, I, I, I can't do that, I don't know what she would say, I don't know what she would say, and I had to look at her and go, you're a playwright now, Holland, and you know better than anybody else what Anne would be telling us right now. Um, and she went home and wrote that speech um, and came in and I said, yeah, that's exactly right. So that when she delivers that speech and then says, I never got to give that speech, we all feel that loss in that moment. Um, and and um, so there was one liberty being taken for the sake of telling the story that we were telling in the play uh, there, and I, I think that was um, that was a good use of not actual history that happened there. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Yeah, if, if I could just, uh, I'm so behind you on that. I mean, I'm so with you because it seems to me, it, especially if we're writing people in history, we have to know why we're telling it now. Yeah. There has to be a, a, just like a crystalline reason, because of, otherwise it's just a lot of facts and they don't add up. Whereas if there's something behind it, to do all that and then say that's a speech I didn't get to give, oh, I didn't get to give, that really works. That really works. And, and for you, do you, I, from, from what you've done before, you, you seem to have a fluidity with the, how the history is handled. So where, where is the, you know, the line with exactitude versus dramatic license? Well, the uh, Alice in the Resurrection of Alice, she's fictitional, so there's no history of hers that I'm really maintaining, but uh, it happens between 1939 and 1969, and in America, those were extremely tumultuous yeah. years, and so I bring up many of the things that are happening as she gets older, just to say, this is the marker, and those people that might be alive to remember, would remember, or children that are learning can say, oh, is that what we're doing again? I try to keep true to that. I guess it might kind of sound like a blah, 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 blah facts, but I try to just, I, I insert it here, yeah. here, just to say this is as we're moving, and this mm -hmm. is what's going on. With uh, Josephine, um, I've read so, so many books on her, and um, I actually met her sister in uh, uh, Monte Carlo, and I heard a tape of her in her own words yeah. saying so many things that is 
giving me chills right now. And I met a man in St. Louis who was 81 year old. Um, he had been a judge, black judge, and a lawyer. And he said, and I said, well, you know, this book conflicts with this book and, and this and that and da da da. He said, you go with whatever she says. And I said, well, you know, people say she was given to making stories. He said, like, the history you read is true. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you go with what she said, whatever she said. So I took that tape. And I took uh, her sister, who didn't remember everything, because Josephine left when she was 13, and left her home. And, um, and then she left the country when she was 19. So her sister um, could tell me about the family. She could tell me about you know, the calls and the help that Josephine gave. But anyway, I try to stay true to that, because really, um, it's a real person, and I and I don't. The man who was 81, I forget his name too. I hate this. I'm real bad with names. <laughs> but he he said I have been in an exalted position in this country in the legal system. I have seen the laws. I'm a black man, and I was a lawyer. You know, in the this is in the 1980s that he was 81. So he was born in you know the turn of the century, and he said, and I have seeing the laws come and go and the machinations that that come across as progress and I can tell you unequivocally that nothing has changed. Wow. Nothing has changed. And he said do not and he didn't even know that I didn't sing and dance. <laughs> He's, I do sing and dance a little bit just for any casting people. <laughs> <laughs> Do not make her life a big musical. Whoever does it, they're going to do all the fanfare, all the songs, oh, beautiful numbers, and the clothes. He spent said, but she was so much more than that. You tell her story and understand nobody wants to hear it and nobody's going to pay you for it. But it needs to be told. You tell it. And I just adored him so much. And, um, and and he, he didn't know, but he was already reinforcing what I had in mind anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, so I do try to stick with the history. Yeah, of course. But see, that's the history that turns me on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you said when you heard her, her voice. It, it, yeah, that's the stuff that's way more specific than in 19 blah blah. No. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. You weave that in, but you get to her voice <laughs> and her and what he's talking about. We had a. Um, we did the show again in Austin last year uh, at the Zach Theater, and it was an amazing opportunity to be in Austin and be performing the show, and it was a great big hit for them, which was wonderful. Um, but there were so many people that came that said, you know, I knew Anne, or I met Anne, and she was one of those people that you locked eyes with, and, and uh, she, everybody was her best friend. Um, and so it was really moving, but uh, several of her kids came to see the show again, and um, there is a whole ongoing thing about, um, you know, who's doing, who's bring, they're, they're getting ready to go down uh, to the beach for the 4th of July, and so that's part of what Anne is dealing with while she's in the governor's office. She's giving everybody assignments and what's going on for the 4th of July and everything, and um, and there's a whole thing with her daughter Ellen um, about the uh, will you go get those red chairs out of the out of the attic and and rent a van and will you take those red chairs over to the housekeeper and she's got all these things and she says and if you do this this for me you will not have to cook or clean up or do anything you will be the princess of the van um, and Ellen was at the show one night and I had the opportunity to say Ellen, did you do all that with the red chairs and the van and all those kind of things? And she said, yes, I did. I said, and were you the princess of the van? She said, no, I was not. <laughs> she said, she said I did a lot of cooking and cleaning and everything. And, and, and she said, so I don't know if, if Holland made that up or, and I said, well, it's a really good joke. So we'll, we'll leave it at that, won't we? And she said, you're right. If you can see people's bodies too, I'm a huge believer in the body not tell you know, the body tells the truth. And uh, uh, Pat Nixon specifically never, never would speak in public. She was very, very private. And I saw this one little clip, it was hard even to 
get to. And it was a little clip after he had uh, lost the gubernatorial race in uh, California, and they moved to New York, and the reporters were right in her face, saying, how do you feel now that he's lost? And, Don't you miss California? And I said, uh, she was there, and she said, oh, well, I always say it's only a plane right away. And when I saw her do that with her knees, I thought, that's the character. That's the character. It was just, please go away. Please just go away. Um, that's her. Yeah. I mean, you see it in the bodies. <laughs> I've seen her do this show at least four times, and she just makes you want to have known each of these women. It just. Well, I admire. You know, I. It's a Valentine. Yeah. yeah. During one of our early rehearsals, Holland was doing. A she was doing a thing where she was doing a ton of sniffing um, throughout, and it was a lot of going on. And I, I was trying to figure out: is this just Holland? Does she have a stuffy nose? What's going on here? And and um, I, I approached her and I was like, "What's going on there?" She said, "Oh, I found this video, and Holland had, and and Anne had this sniff thing that she did, and everything." And I said. I'm wondering if maybe we have to let go of that one. <laughs> that might tell a story that we, I'm not sure we want told at the top of the play. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll let that one go. It's like, everything else you're doing is great. Like, let's let that one go. So let's move on to venues. Where do you find your venues? How do you, you talked a little bit about sending out mailers and all the PR that you have to do to promote and, and get booked in all these places. It is a sort of endless, how long did you say you've been doing this next year? I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, 12 years maybe. Okay, so it, it, there's a longevity in one woman. I mean, but the yellow wallpaper your... goes back way, way before that, but okay. it was off and on because I had a full time job. Mm -hmm. So, how do you find the places? Where? How do you get there? How do you get booked in? And you said something about the eighty-one year old man said nobody's going to pay you, but people do pay you. Yes, they do. Okay, so how do you get the money? What? <clears throat> oh well, that. Um, <laughs> if I may avoid that for a second, Elaine and I were talking the other night about the fact that you have to have an audience for your one-person show. And one of, I think, three ways to do that is you get a subject that you already have a built-in clap for. So I had been doing the short stories as fundraisers for the East Lynn Company that my husband founded with that period. And I thought, maybe the bed quilt, maybe I could plug in with quilting organizations. And that's when I started doing the one person oral interpretation, doing the stories in, in addition to the pull out stuff. And libraries have less and less money now, so this isn't quite as good an idea as it used to be. But I'll start out with if I know where I want to go, and I sort of lily bart my way around the country. So I've been I've done sixteen performances in Seattle in two years because I started there because I had a lot of friends out there. And I start by looking for libraries often. You can buy, get a whole list online easily. And then I find the website. And then I find the booking person. And then I write a form email. And then in my mind, I follow up on the phone. But there's never time for that. And if one of those comes through, then I can start building a tour around that. But uh, I mean, thank God for the internet now. Uh -huh. I, I don't send, I, I don't use a single stamp. You know, everything is on the internet. And if you can build uh, a website, that is going to sell it for you. Uh, a website with a little bit of video, if you can get it. Uh, so that I can do a cold call, talk to someone for two minutes only, and say, I have this thing. Uh, I'm going to be sending you an email for an email coming from Elaine Branca and uh, that has a link to the website which has a seven minute video. I hope you can have a moment to look at that. So they don't have to spend a lot of time with me. It, it, it's very important because think about it. When someone cold calls you, if they want to tell you all about it, you're thinking, I don't know you. I don't even know if you're any good. You're wasting my time. But it, it's just, bing, I'm going to be sending it to you. And it, it's so helpful. Uh, I have a website with um, video footage, and I usually 
uh, go to educational places, usually colleges because they have more money. Um, and if I, like I just came back from Florida, I did Polk State College, and when they said they were going to do this, then I just, you know, flooded all the universities I could think of in, in Florida, and I said, and I'll already be there, so yes. you don't have to bring me in. That helps a lot. Yes. And uh, there was one that had wanted to bring me in before in Tampa, and I said, I'm going to be there if, you know, we can do this. But she said, well, they were booked up for that particular uh, year, the, the uh, scholarly year, but I may be in, in the exactly. fall. you laid mm -hmm. the groundwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, and Bethune-Cookman College and places, uh, they all said, well, it was too late a notice for me to be fit in, in, but I invited them to come. I don't know if they came or not. I had a really, really nice audience, and they were very receptive. But I usually do uh, institutions, and I love to travel, personally. And I was in Mali once. And I went to the U.S. Embassy. I usually go to the U.S. Embassy when I'm lost. <laughs> and and um, there was a group playing. And I said, they sound American. And they said, they are American. I said, oh, how did they book this? And they said, oh, well, if you're in town, we will book you. I said, really? I said, is that just here? or? And they said, all the embassies do that. Wow. And so now I, I've been going, yeah, I went to South Africa in 2015. I talked to a consulate there. And I said, I need you to help me launch an international tour, uh, well, a national tour of South Africa. I said, so you need to talk to your colleagues in Pretoria and Johannesburg and Cape Town and all over everywhere and the universities and whatever. And he's looking at me like, I don't know you. <laughs> and I said, but you go to my website and here's a book. It's based on a book. And do you have information, uh, you know, an email you'll share with me? And he did. And I said, okay, and I'll send you blurbs of people that love me. Because now I also, whenever I go somewhere, I ask them for a letter of endorsement. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that you can have a, a whole list of endorsements. Oh, we loved her, loved her, loved her. And sometimes I'll write it myself. <laughs> say, I need it on your letterhead. Now you can change it if you don't believe what I just glowingly wrote about me. <laughs> but you know, these are, these are things, because a lot of people, they, they love you, but they won't get around to writing. But if you give them a template, they'll either just sign their name to it, or they'll rewrite it, because you gave them an idea. So I do that. Um, so you know, which that has to get away from, and I think this could relate to so many people, it has to get away from that nice girl thing, you know? A nice girl doesn't brag. Right. A nice girl doesn't say, what, right. they'll come to you. No, they won't. And I used to, I'm, I don't have a nice veneer anyway, apparently. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I used to work on being nice. And smiling a little more, not a lot. And then I just said, no, no, no. So when people say, well, how was it? I was flawless. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, you should have been there. <laughs> My mistakes were flawless. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and actually, they look at you a little different, like the guy in the consulate. And he actually wrote me back. And I went to the uh, foundation library, and I said, I've been researching grants, and they just haven't been able to help me. I don't, I've been there three times, and... I tell them what somebody else told me, and they said, oh, well, try this. And he said, well, here. And he gave me, he said, I'm glad you still want to do this. He said that to me. Yeah. And then, uh, so anyway, he, he gave me a thing. He said, this will not be at the Foundation Library. And he said, and check it out in February. February 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th. And it kept saying, come back, come back. And then I wrote him, I said, am I in the right place? Because they're, and he said, no, it's the money. And I don't know if it's the current administration, that wow. is just not art friendly, mm -hmm. but um, but he said keep looking, and so we're into March, and I'm not giving up. No, but, um, no. Yeah. Well, yeah. and you are all flawless. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen that play. That I saw it twice. Oh, but she was yeah. real good, and I'm looking forward to seeing you. Obviously, with a name like Colin Taylor, she didn't have to work. Too hard to find a venue, I would think. Um, so, how how did the trajectory? Yeah, yeah, Holland. Um, one of the first people that she, I mean, she was working on writing it. Uh, she her agent knew she was writing it, um, and when it was completed, her agent ended up sending it to uh, 
a gentleman out in California who ended up being our executive producer, who served mainly as her general manager first. Um, and he actually, for years, has been the um, kind of main producer and general manager of the tuna shows, the, the, the tuna boys in Texas. So he was, that was the reason that the agent thought of him, because of his connections to Texas even though Holland never wanted to do the play in Texas. She was afraid to do the play in Texas. So um, it ended up being that was where we started. And um, uh, Kevin Bailey, who's an equity actor, and um, he lives out in LA, um, made uh, his connection to the Galveston um, Theater, the Opera House there. And they said, of course, oh my god, Holland Taylor's going to do a play about Anne. And, uh, yes, come here and do that. And so that's where the first one was. And then it ended up, you know, we needed another venue. And these were very short runs. I mean, she was doing five performances at that time as we were doing the the build up. So then we went to San Antonio. Um, and then from there, we actually played Austin, but we played the Paramount, uh, which is more of kind of a concert venue there in Austin. Um, and at that point, Holland had connected with Bob Boyette, um, who she knew uh, and uh, from their connections and in the business, it's who you know, obviously. Um, and uh, he had come on board as a producer, and he had established the connections for Chicago and for the Kennedy Center. Um, so it was all kind of Bob setting that up and um, you know, both venues that were very excited about the show. And then, interestingly enough, we waited a year for a Broadway theater. Um, we wanted, uh, we were ready to go. We had done Chicago, we had done uh, DC, the Kennedy Center, and the reviews were great and everything was good. We had designed the set to go in any Broadway theater except the Vivian Beaumont <laughs> Theater. <laughs> Because why would we play the Vivian Beaumont Theater at Lincoln Center? Um, so the, the set was ready to go. Um, and I actually was working at Lincoln Center at the time. I was the resident director on War Horse. Um, but we were waiting for a full year for a, a Broadway theater to open up. So that was a long journey um, of going, you know, maybe this show isn't going to last that long. I, know. I mean, it's horrible, but that's how it works, you know. There's all these vultures sitting around waiting for the theaters and things, and um, it never happened for one of the traditional theaters, and War Horse was ending. Um, and... The Vivian Beaumont Theater was open, and uh, the the people there at Lincoln Center looked at me and said, "Do you think you could play Anne in the Vivian Beaumont Theater?" I said, "Yes, yes, sure, sure we could. I don't know. We're gonna play a one woman show in the same stage that there's been life size horses. Uh, yeah, sure, sure I can." Um, and then we were like really quickly went to work on redesigning the entire set, and um, you know, very lucky we had. Uh, you know, Broadway producers and people behind it. But the those producers, to their credit, and Holland went out in the world across the country to get people to fund the show. Um, we did uh, we did parties out in L.A. where we, where it was just these connections of people that were connected to Anne that were excited about getting her message out there again. We were do, we were down in D.C. Um, just doing major fundraising to try and make it happen. So it wasn't just like somebody snapped their fingers and they had the money to put the show on. Um, and uh, uh, but luckily they did, and we had a nice healthy run there in um, in uh, at, at Lincoln Center. And I should say that the play's been published now and is out there in the world. Um, there have been, I think, two or three uh, productions so far, and people are picking it up, which is really exciting for me, too, because it always existed at, as our big production. Um, and I'm excited to see people taking it out there and, and doing the smaller versions of it because it, it, the essence of the play can be captured that way. Yeah. In Holland's brain, it always needed to be done this way. <laughs> um, but I know that um, there's going to be some beautiful uh, theatrical productions out there that are going to come about. Well, that was one of my questions is, do any of you see 
this having a life beyond you and other people doing this material that have become so associated. <laughs> 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 uh, we got it published. Oh, yeah, wow. Wow. Are doing with three women. And have you, have, Benjamin, have you seen any of these other productions? I haven't had the, uh, the ability to see them. There were, um, there were uh, I think, two so far in Texas and one in, I think, Indiana just recently. Um, but I just haven't been able to get there to see any of them. But I've seen uh, the reviews, and they're wonderful. And I've seen pictures, and it's so strange to see someone else in that wig. Um, but it's wonderful. It's it's really incredible. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would love to just insert here, because uh, I have this mantra of keep the power, keep the power. When we brought the show off Broadway, we had not. We've been doing it for seven years, eight years, off, you know, out of uh, the country. But I didn't think to bring it to New York because it's a gentle story, you know, a sweet story. And I thought, oh, New York is like, oh, motherfucker, motherfucker. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I didn't think it was the style. <laughs> you know, we don't know our own power. We, and actors are so used to sort of going, okay, and can't do that. Can't do that. You bring up the idea of compromise. How much are you willing to compromise the venue, the money, the materials? You know, there's a lot of networking from everything that all of you have said, a lot of legwork, a lot of, you know, negotiating of the various things. So, how do you negotiate compromise? I like negotiating better than compromise. Yeah. <laughs> negotiate. Okay, we'll stop it there. Well, I, I would say once you're on, once you're on site, I mean, this whole thing, once a sponsor has picked me up, it is a collaboration. Once you show up in that space, you're the one who knows how to do a good show, but you're in their home. So you have to be very diplomatic. I did a senior citizen complex at one point, and I was trying to move the chairs a little bit for better sight lines, and one of the residents really gave me a hard time. You know, what was I doing there with her chair? <laughs> That you really have to be aware that you are a guest in this place, but you're also the expert. And, and, and you know, the compromise comes up. You got me saying that. It's not just about money to me. I, I have found it, it one of the most important aspects of the whole thing, so wherever you arrive, is everything you do from the get go, from the time you arrive, has to show respect for that crew and for mm -hmm. those people because a lot of people start with a chip on their shoulder who do you think you are coming in and well, we know our stuff and I, i'm always reinforcing them sending thank you notes afterwards uh, learning their names right away because it is a collaboration with the crew mm -hmm. and it, if they feel that you get mm -hmm. them you're going to get a much better show if you come in like it's not going to work well and the other if you know it builds this longevity built into a one woman show because when Katrina and I went to your show we talked to the man who booked you and he said oh yes I booked her 10 years ago and when I moved to this job yeah. mm -hmm. I thought I have to find her and bring her here and that's the kind of you create that kind of goodwill mm -hmm. and you, you make sure that you add to your own longevity in, in, for your show. Well, so I'm curious about what kind of contract you actually work under and do you get housing? Oh, yeah, under an equity waiver. It's a one-person show. You can go through the union once a year, and you sign a contract that gives you uh, an ability to do it on a waiver. Once you have two people, then you need a contract. But one person, yeah, it's a union waiver. And absolutely, they could show up. And people are getting more and more about travel, bringing you in. I, you know, I, I say I need it because they treat you differently. Now, if they needed to put it in one check, they can say, okay, I'll give you 500 for travel, but we have to write one check. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But I don't want them to think I just show up. Yeah. You know? And people will try to pull that, and they treat you differently. <coughs> I actually spoke to um, Brian Hanley at Equity, who is the business rep who handles that theater, um, that waiver for solo shows, because I think it's you know, something that we, 
need to be aware of. Um, and also, in terms of partnering with um, regional theaters to help build your show, to workshop your show. You know, if you have contacts at regional theaters that you've worked at, they might be interested in hiring you on a workshop contract or an SPT to develop it if it's at that point. Um, so there are things, and I'm, I'm also kind of fascinated by your story about the pay map, you know, having a pay map in situation so that you are the producer and then you can contribute to pension and health because that's very, very important. So, quick question. I go under the guest artist contract. Oh. And uh, uh, I forget the names of the people in equity, but you call and they handle either you know the East Coast, the West Coast, the South, or whatever. And the paymaster I usually use is, and I forget that name too. I'm real bad with names, but it'll come <laughs> to me. But Check to Motion is what I use for Florida because the paymaster I usually use did not. Uh, just like the rest of the world. It's, it's a strange place. <laughs> <laughs> you, you started to get a little bit into this before, but it had my, my question really had to do with the the way you the three individual ladies, I don't think this applies to Benjamin, but how you how you shape your own financial package for presentation. Because it sounds from what I've heard all evening is that you're probably forced into being pretty malleable based on the venues that contact you or that you contact knowing that they can afford to do what you have to do. And I wondered how you navigate those waters with every venue that interests you and that is interested in you. Yeah, yeah. I, if it's a theater, I, uh, before I even talk to them, I find out the size of the theater. I figure 50% of the theater times what's the ticket price. So if it's a 200 seater, what if they sold $130? They make 3000 a night. I'll say, okay, 2500 a performance. You know, that, and that's low. I'd like to get a, that's why I'd like to get a 600 seat theater. You know, but I, I want to participate in what they would be doing, but I don't want to put them up against a wall. That's why I would never say you have to sell out to <coughs> cover this, obviously not. But you know, when people say, oh, we're interested, tell us how much you charge in an email, I won't do that. I'll say, let's talk. Now, I'm not going to write it down, because they all want you to go first. You know, so I don't think I'm all that malleable. <laughs> you know? No, you're not. No, they're just guys. Yeah. That's a great formula, though. That's yeah, I think it will. Because you're seeing it through their eyes. Mm -hmm. like they, they don't, they want to believe you're a business person who gets what they're doing. That helps a lot. If you're an artiste, you think I just work more, and they're 99 seater, what are they going to be able to do? Yeah. One theater in Chicago, uh, they didn't have a lot of money, but they were happy that I was one person in a bench. And they said what they and they said this, and so now I kind of add it to anybody else. They said we do have contacts with the universities. So Northwestern booked me, and it was one night, and it was fabulous. And the money is mine. And they booked me in three other uh, universities, and it wasn't to do the show. It was to do a master class for a couple hundred dollars. Fine. So. You know, the, and they were willing to work because they said, well, we don't have this, but we do have contacts. Mm -hmm. So that's another way to get in. That's very yeah. universal. That's great. Yeah. yeah. That they would do the work. That's yeah, unusual. Yeah, I can't get them to do that. <laughs> but one thing I wanted to say is ask, ask for what you think you're worth. I mean, that, that was really great to hear. You know, like, you do the math and everything, but don't sell yourself short. Oh. I mean, that's the other thing is, like, you, you need to ask for, you're working hard. As a director, I love actors because they work so hard. And, and you need to value the work that you do. So, and especially when it's only you up there, there's no one else, that you, you need to ask for the money. You know, you're out there on the road, you go in different places, you don't know what it's like, the lay of the land. What are your must haves Wow. Well, uh, uh, when I do it locally, I find a college kid and I hire that person in an informal, like something like here. That person would change the props and do the sound cues on a, a CD player. And they'd learn the show and thank God I could go and we could just set it up. When I go out of town, I go by myself just because I, I can't really carry another person along. I can't call them every two months and say I have another job for you and you get an extra airfare and get all that. Right, right. But when you go, when you travel, what what is your 
you know, do you bring a candle for your hotel room? Is it, do you have special food that you bring? Right. Is it kind of right, right, right. on the road? Or right. Or I guess what I was saying was, I actually find the airiness of being by myself on my own time, other than that, uh, more freeing for me than having someone, I'm wondering if I paid them yeah. enough or kept them happy. So, but now other people need that support system. You have to figure out for yourself what's most worth it. Yeah. I must have a uh, transportation. Yes. If, if, uh, if it's a big city like when I was in Chicago, I could jump on the train or the bus or whatever. Uh, but I was in Sebastopol, California, which is the cutest little place, but you need a car. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't think of that until I was there. Well, I happened to have a friend that was there also who had nothing to do with the play, who had two cars. But that's when I realized I need transportation, uh -huh. and I have to know that. When I was in uh, D.C., you can jump, you know, any major metropolis area, you can jump on the, on the uh, public transportation. But I need a, I need a car or, or transportation, knowing that, that I can get from here to there. Uber and Lyft are your friends. You know, because yeah. I was going to uh, rent a car in Florida recently. It was going to be $240 for two days. Crazy. <laughs> and I Uber and Lyft was uh, a round trip and to the airport and everything hungry. Yeah. And I didn't have to think about the road. Okay, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. There is a little more food.